going to do chapter 2, and uh, we should be uh, traveling through the verses eight, 11 through 18. I picked the title, uh, Be Careful, Your Motives Are Showing. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be, be up front. Like, I heard that this week, or maybe last week, come sometime, uh, a preacher said that in a sermon. And when I was studying this out, I'm like, See, that, that's perfect. Like, that's perfect. Be careful. Your motives are showing. And, uh, you know, full disclosure, our motive is Christ. And, uh, and, 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 and so, but you'll see as this passage plays out, just the, the urging uh, for us as God's people. Verse 11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the former. So, as we always do, I need to ask the Lord for prayer uh, before we get into it. And so let's ask him and invite him in as we go this morning. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for what you've already done, which you've already showed us, whether it be by song or testimony of a, of a missionary um, Lord, just, just being able to share uh, with each other in conversation. But really, the, the main reason we gather on a Sunday is for this purpose. And that is to open up the Word of God and to hear from you. Lord, it's my desire that as, as I present the truth that I've studied and how I've studied it out, Lord, that we would all have our hearts, ears, minds open to the truth and not some preconceived idea that we already have. Lord, that we would truly allow the Word of God to speak to us in this, in this, this hour. So, God, I pray you help us. Set it all aside and just hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, uh, just as we um, kind of are jumping in right now in this particular passage in, in verse Peter, um, it is on the heels of what we talked about last week, how that Jesus came to us as a priesthood, and he granted us that, that royal priesthood status. And uh, we talked about that last week. Uh, but, but kind of on the heels of the two verses, 9 and 10, it sort of, in a way, kind of launches us into this. So I want to highlight that real quick before we jump in. Mm -hmm. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You might remember... Uh, as we took the time to really try to break that down, navigate that, that God has, you know, there, there, there was something to a royalty and the priesthood. There were two separate things in the, in the, especially the Jewish mind. But God is actually combining them for us in this. We have royal blood running through our spiritual veins because of the death, burial, resurrection of the blood that Jesus Christ shed for us. We have royalty in our veins. But he's also made us the priesthood. We have that, that fellow, that fraternity, if you would, of the believer that we can absolutely approach the same throne of grace that everybody else can, that Moses did, that, that, that you know, anybody. We all have that same access. We are a chosen generation, royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. So there's all of these specific phrases he said that you should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his light. Now that, that phrase right there, we're going to kind of revisit again a little bit later on. Because we are to show forth Christ. Show forth the praises of him. Uh, we don't 
We're not here for us. We're not here to, to, to uh, check the spiritual box, so to speak. We don't attend church on Sunday. And, 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 and maybe some of you are at this stage in your life, in your Christian growth, where yes, you are checking that box because it helps me feel better about myself. But, but, but may God help us grow to the point that where we're absolutely doing it so that we can show forth the praise of Jesus Christ. Amen. And not just check the box. Because eventually that's going to get old and you're going to find a good reason not to do it. Okay? So uh, may that not be the case, but, but, but we, we grow, grow forth into that. But that he called, because we, why? Because he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. <clears throat> you're going to see all of these things that are going to play into the motives that should be showing okay the motives he called you out of darkness we were darkness we talked about that in sunday school this morning remember what you were right again don't spend time reminiscing because sometimes people that'll drag them down a hole in a dark alley you don't want to be in and satan will use that if you're not careful but remembering, just remembering, okay, this is where I was. I was dark. There was darkness in my life. But now he's put us into his marvelous light, which in the time past are not a people, but now are the people of God. So there was a point where especially the Gentile believers, and that was kind of the, a good majority of the people that Peter was writing to, like you were just nobody. There was the Jews and then whomever else. But now you're all together. Like there was a time where you weren't anything, but now you are in Christ. Mm -hmm. there's, so there's some rejoicing in that. But, uh, but uh, excuse me, the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Okay, so there was a segregation. Again, we pointed this out in Sunday school, but there was a segregation of people that could appreciate the quote-unquote goodness of God, if you would. Not that everybody didn't appreciate it, but it just... That's down through the pages of time. That's sort of how it worked itself out. There was a division. But God has brought that together. Now as a church, we can be unified and we can be together because we have obtained mercy. Okay? So when we jump into this particular passage now in verse 11, with all that in mind, with all that, that being said, think about these two words, dearly beloved. Dearly beloved. It's endearing. It's, 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 it's bringing it together. It's, it's, there's a, there's a, there's a, the, the love is, is oh man, it's just a deep agape type of a love. Okay? But with great fondness. Or at a great price. That's what dearly beloved, that's what dearly means. At a great price. With great fondness. There are people in our lives that we can sort of relate that to our spouse dear to us where we have great fondness it should be that way right with great fondness and then there's others in our family in our lives maybe not family that we would feel that way with great fondness but this this matter this part of the letter is peter is saying dearly beloved you know we should we should have that same ideology that same mentality for one another as we gather at church. Dearly beloved, with great fondness. You know, remember, uh, remember the phrase with does absence make, make the heart grow fonder or does it make it wander, right? When we're apart, when we're away, when, when things, when we can't meet for whatever reason, maybe it's not a, a church day, there, there should be a, a fondness there that Hey, I know you're going through some stuff. I know this is hard. And, and Peter's going to address that here in a little bit. But there is some, there's some hard things that we're going to have to walk through. We should be uh, fond of each other. We should be uh, just because there's been a great price paid. That's, that's the thing I like to key in on. There was a great price paid for us to be dearly beloved. Okay? And then obviously beloved means to be to be loved greatly or near to the heart. That's, that's what we're after as a church. As a, as a group of people, as a body of believers, that, that there is a, a nearness of heart to one another when we are uh, 
you know, hurting or when we are not, not together or, or when we are together, there's a nearness of heart to get for us because we are beloved. But I want to point this out. And I've, I've got some passages that I want to uh, show you. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, <clears throat> Jesus or Peter says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came, from, uh, came such a voice to him from excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There's that word beloved. Dearly beloved. Hold on a second. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. The, the, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. That's, a, that's an endearing term that, that Peter is using here. You and I are dearly beloved. Why are we dearly beloved? Because of Christ. Because of what he did. Uh, matter of fact, I think I've got these verses in line here. In John chapter 14. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So, a broad difference between obedience because of duty and obedience because of devotion. Dearly beloved. Are you following along with me? And this is going to probably make a little bit more sense as we track along in this passage. But because of Christ, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, this is why. Because of Christ, we are dearly beloved. Look, let's move on. Let's track along a little bit more in the passage. <clears throat> verse, number, uh, verse number 11. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. When you see that word beseech, um, you, you can almost imagine a person standing in front of you begging you. Like, it's, I implore you. I encourage you. I, I, as, as a pastor, um, I, I, you, you hear me probably refer to this weekly, if not very often, uh, to, to get in to the Word of God and have a relationship with Jesus on your own. That, that's, that's, I beseech you, I, I urge you, get into the Word of God for yourself. Do not depend on Sunday morning only. Please don't do that. Get in the Word of God. So there is a beseeching you, okay? So Peter is, and, and, and the Apostle Paul used the word, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. He's, I'm imploring you. I'm in, I'm, I, I urge you, okay? So Peter, here in this passage, dearly beloved, because of what Jesus did, you would not have that status. You would not have that title if it wasn't for Jesus. You would not be the royal priesthood, the chosen generation, the, the, the ones who have attained mercy, the one people. Uh, you wouldn't have that status if it wasn't for Jesus. You have the status of being dearly beloved because of Christ. I beseech you. Okay? I beseech you, he says, as strangers and pilgrims. Now, we pointed out uh, in Sunday school a seeming contradiction of words here. Because Paul says, now therefore, you are no more strangers. So wait a second. But Peter is calling us strangers? <laughs> well, simply put, it goes right along with uh, one of the songs that, that we sing out there. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. The treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. This world is not my home. Mm -hmm. And so we are, in that sense, strangers and pilgrims. And he's already pointed out that you're strangers, sojourners, things of that nature, because they're, listen, we should not feel at home in this world. No. We should not feel comfortable with the world's entertainment, with the world's uh, 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 desires, with the world, all the things that this world has to offer. We should not feel comfortable with that. And, and honestly, it's actually, <laughs> it should be an, a little bit of a... a, 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 a I just drew a blank on the word. I was going to say motivation, but that's not the word. It should be actually a good thing that we feel like, man, I just, I don't fit in here anymore. 
But when you got saved, you know, those of you who've been saved for numbers of years, and, and uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, where all of a sudden, uh, you know, the time with your friends just wasn't time with your friends like it used to be. Or, or, or with your family. Uh, you know, I grew up in church, so, so in that sense, not too many things changed in my world as far as that goes. But, but I know that, that desires and things of that nature, uh, you know, the things that I would feed, like, it didn't satisfy anymore. Whereas in the world, it was satisfying. Uh, the things that I would go after, or the thing, you, you know what I'm saying, those things right there, when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, the strangers and pilgrims, there's, there's nothing in this world that, that draws me in. Like, I, I don't want to be a part of that. And if I ever do, and I slip up and I feed my flesh in that, there's just an uncomfortability that causes you to just want to repent and draw back to God. And, and, and you feel like lost when you are a part. You feel uh, uh, un, uneven. You don't feel right. You feel off when you are feeding those types of desires. That's because you're a stranger in a pilgrim. And the apostle, or the apostle Peter is pointing that out. This world is not our home. Jesus said in John 15, 19, if he were of the world, the world would love his own. Hey, buddy, come on over here. And they just, they just yuck it up, yuck, yuck it up, you know, so to speak. But because you're not of the world, I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hated you. Now, I'm going to point out here in a second. Then in this verse, he says, among the Gentiles. And we all, we can get this, this, this sort of thinking that we have to isolate. But that's not ever really what Jesus was after. He didn't want us to isolate ourselves so much as he wanted us to insulate ourselves. But he's been track along, okay? Uh, this, world, this world's not our home. That ye abstain, what did he say? I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war. <laughs> are you following with me? It's a war, y'all. It's a war. And, and, and one of my commentators I said pointed this out. It doesn't mean because you won the battle, you won the war. You know, we think sometimes, man, I was good. Kind of brush ourselves off, picked ourselves up. Man, that was a that was a tough battle. We got the victory. You know, no longer. <laughs> but boy, it's a war. It's a war, and it's a continuous war. It's, do you see that? Uh, that you abstain from fleshly lusts, which war, they're not, they're not stopped. <clears throat> Just because you, you beat the flesh today doesn't mean you're going to win it tomorrow. Uh, the, the, the same exact thing that you were fighting today and won the battle over will probably, could potentially get you down tomorrow and the next day. So what is he saying? Abstain from the fleshly lusts which war against the soul? Why? Because you listen. Your flesh wants no, wants nothing to do with the things of the spirit, and the spirit wants nothing to do with your the things of your flesh. So there's conflict. Matter of fact, Galatians chapter five says the flesh lusteth. Against the Spirit. If you notice, I should the King James, they capitalize that word, the S, Spirit. That's, we're talking about God, the Spirit that lives inside of you, the Holy Spirit that moves in the moment you get saved. There is a battle, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So, so in my mind, I can, this is how this sort of plays out. In my mind, I, I, I should read my Bible. On Monday morning, and on Tuesday morning, and on Wednesday morning, and on Thursday, or whatever your time is, I should read my Bible. 
I should be uh, faithful to church. I should be uh, faithful to share the gospel with other people. I should be, uh, 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 you know, forgiving of one another. I should be loving uh, those that are persecuting me. I should be, like in my mind, these are the things that I should be doing. But the spirit is at war against the flesh. And your flesh is like that old saying they had a, a you know a, a, a missionary that won this Indian chief to the Lord and and uh, he came back to him years you know years months later whatever and said how's it going and he said it it's like I have two dogs in me one white dog one black dog and he said it's like the dogs are fighting. And he said, okay, well, which, which dog is winning? He said, whichever one I feed the most. Amen. Did you know that this battle that's taking place, we see on, on, in, there in Galatians chapter 5, mm -hmm. it, it's, 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 it's given to us in plain words in Romans, whichever you feed, whichever you yield to, you will become servants to that walk throughout your day. Man, I feel so, oh, I feel so beat up by this flesh. Oh, wait. Hold on. Who did you yield to? If I'm yielding to the flesh, then not my flesh is going to win this battle. It will. <coughs> Guaranteed. The, the, the point that Paul made in Scripture in Romans was whichever one you yield to will win. So we have to go back to that, that moment or, or maybe even just establish ourselves in that moment. Rather, we can't go back. We have to go recognize, hold on a minute, the reason my flesh is beating me up right now is because I'm yielding to the flesh. The spirit is losing. But we also have the same promise. The moment you yield to the, to the spirit, the spirit wins. Guaranteed victory. Guaranteed victory. <laughs> Okay, so, so but what, what is Peter telling us in here? Abstain from. So this is like the second line of defense. Okay, don't even put yourself near it. You know, it's like a good thing. Like if, you, if you're on a diet, look, we're all, this is a bad time to talk about diets. Okay, I know, but <laughs> if you're on a diet, okay, and you show up to Thanksgiving meal, and there's all that good turkey and all that good ham and all that good whatever you like. The pecan pies and the pumpkin pies and the and just the, the spread, right? Okay, you would be a, a crazy person to show up and just walk through that table and load your plate up and go sit down, right? Like, no, nope, I'm not doing it. Now, you may be able to exercise a little bit of self-control because you're just, man, this is my first day. And I'm strong. I'm, I'm going to say no to all that food. Just going to have one bite of that pecan pie. I'm just going to have one sip of that eggnog. I'm just going to have one. Look, y'all looked at me crazy when I said eggnog. Non-alcoholic, okay? <laughs> Hildebrand, down at Dylan's, get some real eggnog, you'll be good, okay? Um, and everybody, I'll pray for you. If you don't like eggnog, I'll pray for you. But I'm going to just do one. I'm just going to do one. Just to set that right there. I'm going to do And you can be strong in that moment. But what about the next time or the next time the spirit is going to be getting weaker and weaker because you've got your you are putting yourself out there. Your desires are there. Your body is designed to be hungry. If you have fed it that and you have fed that appetite at some point, it is designed to, to want that. So what do you have to do you have to starve it? One of the friend, one friends of mine said, starve the beast, feed the spirit. Starve the beast, feed the spirit. So what does that mean for us? We're going to have to cut some of the entertainment out. That radio station is going to have to go on some of our, on our playlists. That, that Spotify station is going to have to go on some of our playlists. That, that channel on Netflix is going to have to go on some of our playlists. Uh, that, 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 that entertainment venue that we go to sometimes is going to have to go sometimes because we have to abstain from fleshly lusts. I know that's not popular. That's meddling, Pastor. Notice I didn't say what it was. <laughs> but you know what it is. The Holy Spirit will tell you. And He probably already has told you the moment you click on that television program. 
that he probably already has told you the moment you turn your dial over to that radio program. He probably already has told you when you were spending time with those friends and decided to yuck it up with them over that conversation. Because you are not abstaining from the fleshly lusts. The flesh, uh, the, the lusts of the flesh. Are you following with me, dearly beloved? As strangers and pilgrims? Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. You have the, you, you and I, we have the deciding factor. We have the choice. We have the, we have the choice. But, but as the, I don't have a title up there, as the title mentions, our motives are showing. The, 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 the statement that we made a few weeks ago, you're as close to God as you want to be. Why is that? Your motives are showing. Oh, if our motives are so for, so for the fact that Jesus loved me, and died for me, and buried and rose again for me, and He saved me, <coughs> hey, my motivation will be to abstain from the flesh and lusts mm -hmm. because of what He did for me. It's that simple. It's not because a preacher got up and preached and ripped and you know so they had you know back in the day they had these revival meetings and the and the and the preachers were taking gallons of alcohol and pouring it out on the stage and and people just sensationally just turned their backs on on alcohol you know oh I'm going to do this I'm going to do this for so long and then it died out why because they didn't make the choice in themselves to abstain from it it's not listen it's not necessarily the preacher's position to have to say you should get these things out of your life but to point you to a Savior that gives us all the reason to get things out of our lives. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, we understand there's a war. Verse 12, having a conversation honest among the Gentiles. So there, there it is. I pointed out that we were going to see the word among. <clears throat> we are in this world, but we are not of this world. Remember John 15? See if I can pull it back up here. When Jesus said, you're not of the world. If you were, the, the world would love you his own because you're in the world. Like that's, that's just, um, uh, the more you yuck it up with the guys at work and the girls around the neighborhood or whatever, the more you yuck it up with them, the more you're just going to be one of them. And, and how, are, how good are we showing Christ in those moments? But I also want you to see in Philippians chapter 2. Wait, that's not it. Let's see if I can find it here. There we go. Philippians chapter 2. He says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. God wants us to shine. Remember what he said in, 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 in that verse, uh, uh, in verse 9? Out of darkness into his marvelous light. We should be shining. There, there should be something about us that the people, not because we're walking, listen, this is the proverbial people think you just walk around with your Bible, you know, at work and you go to Walmart and you pay, uh, this, the, the, the cashier's like, that'll be 15.28. Oh, oh, sorry, did I hit you with that Bible? Uh, let me see. Oh, you didn't want my Bible. Okay. Uh, and you, get, you know, we're not doing that. You know, we're not being stupid and awkward about it. Okay. But there is a way that we can reflect Christ Amen. in this world shining among this dark world. You know, they're the ones that get all tripped up over the posts that people put up on Facebook and, and, and the political nonsense that goes on out there. And, and they're, you know, they're, all, they're the ones getting all worked up. And they're the ones having the rallies and the riots and the, you know, burning down the public post offices. And the, right? They're, they're the ones doing that. What are we doing? We're shining as lights. Now, that's not the way to do it. But did you know that Jesus loves you? There's a way in which we can absolutely show the love of Christ in the midst of it. But we can't do that when we're getting all tripped up on the things of this world that lust against the Spirit. Mm -hmm. We'll just jump right in with them. Okay? Having your conversation honest. Okay? So, the, the word uh, honest is not necessarily what we, we think. Firstly, we think, okay, but you've got to be honest with them. So I'm going to tell it like it is. That's, I got to be honest. I'm just going to tell it like it is. I'm going to beat them up over the head with 
all the falsities that they're bringing into into my world when they come in and they say you know that 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 this or that you know they weigh in on this political problem well did you know the bible says you know, that's not necessarily what that means yeah, what it does mean though is properly and orderly arranged beautiful comely admirable having your conversation beautiful admirable <laughs> My fear is, and, and he's not here with us today, but, but Mike Sinclair, uh, they came, and Mike and Charlotte, they, they, they participated in Thanksgiving dinner with us. And he made a statement, you've heard this statement before, <clears throat> how that uh, sometimes people will say, you've probably heard people say this, that you've tried to witness to. I, I don't want to be a Christian, and it's because of the Christians. Have you ever heard that? I know it's out there. Maybe you've even felt that sentiment before you were saved. Uh, people don't want to be a Christian because of the Christians. When they look into the Christian realm and the Christians are fighting each other. And sometimes for good cause. We get that. Like the doctrinal things matter. And, then, and things like we should stand up for what we believe. But there's a way for us to be admirable about it. Comely about it. <laughs> Beautiful about it. Properly and orderly arranged about it. The thing I thought was unique about that is that as we were studying through 1 Timothy, uh, when they saw, when it goes through the, the, the ladies adorn themselves in modest apparel, and then it talks about the pastor should be of good behavior. Those are the same type words. Mm -hmm. Comes from the word, the base word cosmo, cosmos. Properly and orderly arranged. That's... Also, a same a word that God used for this world, for this world uh, that this world is. It's, it's properly and orderly arranged because God created it. So for us, as believers, our conversation, our lifestyle, our behavior ought to be in such a way that it properly, ad admirably, and, and, and in a comely way represents Jesus. People have a desire to be a Christian because you are. Like this question. Who in your life wants to be a Christian because you are? You know, you ever thought about that? Or who in your life is like, man, that's Christian, I don't want to. Are you, are you with me? Sometimes, or, or, or they don't see a difference in what they're doing, what you're doing. So why should they? Who in your life wants to be a Christian because you are? It's a good question. Well, here's, what, here's, 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 the, here's, the, here's the sort of changing of gears, if you would. Mm -hmm. But that whereas they seek against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So, <laughs> that whereas they speak against you. And I, I just wrote this. To me, this is just how this is just how it plays out in my mind. So you just bear with my simplicity here. Um, it's going to happen. They're going to speak against you. People are going to speak against you for doing the right thing, for being a Christian, for standing up and saying, "Ah, I'm not going to do that." Everybody else at work is doing it. Or everybody else in your friend group is doing it. Everybody else in your family is doing it. I'm not doing that. Come on, why? We've always done this, man. Come on. Come on, sister, let's do this. Like, we've always had fun doing this. Why can't you? And they'll speak evil against you. And, and that's not always the fun thing to do, guys. I know. I know. It's not the popular thing to just stand, stand out. What are they going to think? How is that being a Christian? Follow what God says. Just be, just be what he said. Listen, watch this. Because it gets better. They speak against you as evil evil doers. I speak against you as evil doers. That they may by your good works which they shall be whole. Did you notice that? The good works that they're talking about is that honest conversation. Having your conversation honest. They may by your good works, the, the behavior, the orderly, the proper, the admirable, the comely behavior, they are going to see it. Look, they will see it. They may mock you and call, call, you, know, uh, you know, ridicule you and push you away, or, you know, unfriend you on your social media platform, whatever that's worth. 
but they still they do see it. This is the that that's the thing that 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 matters here. They still see it. Okay? They still see the good works. They still see that that when everybody else is, you're not. Or they still see that that when you when they lashed out at you, you responded in kindness. That when they ridiculed you for ridiculed you for sharing the gospel with them, you responded Christ like. That, that, that when the family event was going, it was a big family event, you said, you know, I'm sorry, I'm still going to church. Uh, that, that when, when oh, hey man, let's do this, let's have a good time. But that's your time with God. And it was going to interfere with your time with God. And you said, sorry, I'm out. I've got to spend time with my Lord. They see it. They see it. And here is the motivation, Okay. This is where it's at. This is where it's at. They may by your good works which they shall behold. Watch this. These two words. Glorify God. And, and I'm going to point out just, just, just for the sake of the message because we're going we're to get to these. I want to point out the different times that this matters the most throughout this passage. This, is, this should be our motivation. Glorify God. Glorifying God. Look in verse number 13 for the, the, these, these, this phrase, for the Lord's sake. Uh, look at verse number uh, 15, uh, the will of God. Verse number 16, as the servants of God. Uh, verse 17, fear God. Verse 18, with all fear. Are you, are you tracking along? Our motivation should not be for, for our glory, for our uh, accolades, so I get recognized. So they put my picture on the screen at, at Cottonwood and give me special recognition for what I did. And that may happen from time to time. Hey, we think, you know, we have a time where we want to recognize our volunteers. You know, recognize the missionaries, right? But that's not why we do this. We do this to glorify God. Now back to that verse. This should be our motive. If we do it for any other reason, it is selfish, it's prideful, and thus it is sinful. Well, I'm doing right, and you didn't recognize it. Be careful, your motives are showing. Well, I, did, I, I went to church, and, and, and my, my vehicle still broke down. Be careful, your motives are showing. Well, I, I gave my tithes and I made sure God uh, got that 10% and I even gave a little bit more to help with missions and, and I that, that thing in my house still broke down. Be careful. Your motives are showing. I shared the gospel and I, I stood up in, in front of the, the, the work crew or the friend crew or the family crew and, and shared the gospel and I got ridiculed and, and they even uh, told me I was no longer welcome to say that anymore. Uh, be careful. Your motives are showing. The, the motive should be to glorify God. F for the will of God. But I love this because it says they shall behold, uh, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know what that breaks down to? By the way, let me show you the verses. John 15, 8. Here it is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. What fruit is he looking for, by the way? Later on, earlier on in that chapter, he says, abide in me, in my words abide in you, then shall ye bear much fruit. So it's the, the producing of other souls, the regeneration of lives, okay? That's where God is glorified. So when I am living in such a way and I, that my works may glorify Him, it is for the production or the producing of souls in, 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 uh, in His kingdom. That's how He's glorified. Also, uh, Romans chapter 15, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive you one another as Christ also received us 
to the glory of God. Now, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. This in a nutshell, you want to read this chapter by itself and you'll, you'll see this in a nutshell is the gospel of Jesus Christ that's preached to all. That is how he's glorified. Listen, if you getting ridiculed or you getting, uh, uh, you know, giving in your missions offering plate or you uh, coming to church or you taking time to be, be, make sure that you have your time with God. If you do that and you are ridiculed or you are still find yourself in financial ruin and it still brings honor and glory to God, there is the motivation. God, I'll do it. I'll, 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 I will serve you. I will do everything I can for you because I want you to be glorified, not me. I want souls to be saved, not me to be lifted up and elevated. And, and so how that breaks down, that, uh, <laughs> that they may by your uh, good works uh, in the day of visitation, it's, there's a lot of different uh, opinions on it. Because visitation literally means like a time of inspection. So we can say, maybe that fast forwards to the time uh, of, of the judgment seat when everybody's standing before God. But we also have to think, what about that day when the Holy Spirit reaches into their heart and their spirit and says, hey, you need to be saved. What about that time? When they're visited with the word of God. Will your good works flash in their mind? That's, that's sort of the, the, the concept that's being played out in this verse. Yes, there's going to come a time where everybody's going to stand before God. At that point, it's too late for those individuals. But what about now? What about now when they have an opportunity to be presented with the gospel of Jesus Christ and they are visited with the gospel? Will they see your face and turn from it? Or will they see your face and the good works and turn towards it? That's what we're after. Because he receives glory by, his, by, by people being saved. That's how we honor him. Now, I, I, I'm not going to take the time to go there, but Peter, actually, in uh, chapter, chapter 21 of John, Jesus talked to him about, about how that he's going to be stretched out and he's going to be laid before all people. And it says this saying, uh, he said, be, signifying what? Death. He should glorify God. And Peter ends up getting crucified. He asked to be, historically, he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't want to. But people still saw uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in Peter's death because he was pointing people to Christ. And as a result, people are pointed to glorify him. Are you following with me? Yeah, now, Peter wouldn't have known that at this time when he wrote this. But they may by your good works glorify God in the day of visitation. That's what we're after. We want people to glorify God. Now, here's how this plays out sort of in our everyday life. We have a few more minutes. Verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. There it is. So glorify God for the Lord's sake. Whether it be to the king as supreme or... Uh, unto governors as unto them that are set by him for the punishment of evildoers for the praise of them that do well. So, <laughs> we wrestle at this. We just be honest. Because it's like, now hold on. You know our, our, our government is so corrupt and it is so crooked and we have all these crooked politicians in there. Amen. But what you have to, <laughs> what you have to recognize is this does not mean that we have to submit to them. No. Mm. It's to the ordinance. Yes. Now the ordinance itself actually plays out, if the word, if I've studied it properly, literally means something fabricated, created, or formed. So it's not the institutions themselves, or the, the people themselves, not the office, but the officers, but the office. Mm -hmm. They're going to make laws. They're going to make ordinances, if you would. And they're going to create uh, institutions by which we should operate under. 
And Jesus, Peter is telling us, submit yourself. Now, remember, we're to show forth his praise. Are you following? We are to show forth his praise. Remember I said that in chapter 2, verse 9? That we are to show forth his praise. Submission is humbly recognizing God's absolute authority in our lives. How many of you can see that? How many of you know he has absolute authority in our lives? God has absolute authority in our lives. So it simply means, uh, submission means to arrange under or to place in order or rank under or to make myself subject to. Because we are looking to ultimately bring glory to God, bring souls to Him. If, when people see you interacting with our, our laws or our institutions, and you're out there, you know, running the American flag at the Capitol and burning it down because, okay, you know, because you're a patriot. Okay, does that world see Andrew Kennard running with an American flag or do they see Jesus? That's the point. We should be submitting, subjecting ourselves to the, listen, by and large, when we say that, by and large, the laws that are in place are for our protection. He put that in there in, in, in verse number 14. Typically, this is how it works. Uh, punish the evildoers and praise them that do well. In a perfect world, that's what government do, does. They praise the evil, the, the good, and they, they punish the evil. Now, in this day, it seems like they do it the other way around. But the institution themselves, the the, the, the state, the, the, the local city, the township, the whatever, okay? They, they, are the, they are the institution that has been established as the authority over which we operate. So, are we operating in rebellion? Because, well, you aren't preaching Christ in your abortion ideologies. And you're pushing this, this LGBTQ transgender agenda. And so I refuse to, to follow you. Okay. Or do we just humbly submit ourselves in the way that we would to Christ? Not saying you line up with the abortion laws. But in submission and subjection, you give the honor where it's due as if it was God. Again, this is very difficult for us because we see the persons in, in place, in power, and we see the, the corruption that takes place in our political society. But God is telling us that we are to submit. Listen, <laughs> we have two, more than this, examples of people who did this properly. Daniel who purposed in himself that he was not going to defile himself with the king's meat. He honorably and respectfully honored the command of the Lord, the, 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 the promise that he had made, his God, and yet still respected the king. Peter and John, if you remember, were taken into captivity, custody uh, in, in Acts chapter 4 and 5, because he had healed that lame man at the temple. And the best thing they could come up with was, you know, sort of a slap on the wrist and say, stop preaching in Jesus' name. And Peter said, you know what, whether that's right in your eyes or not, we, we cannot tell. But look, all we can tell you is what we've seen. And we're going to preach Jesus. So they respectfully did what they were told. As, as believers, we have to find out what... The, if, if a government is telling us to do something that goes against God's word, then we still have to be submissive in our approach to disobedience. Are you following? Not rebelling. Right. Submission. Like, I'm going to submit to your authority in this, but I'm going to tell you I'm not going to stop preaching about Jesus. Mm -hmm. They haven't done that yet. Uh, maybe they will. I'm sure there's a day coming when they will. They haven't done that yet. 
But, you know, there are, there are Christians living in societies that are absolutely having to make these types of choices day in and day out. This is not new to his church. It, it's always been a case. And so Peter is trying to help the people. Hey, we are to operate under this. Why? <laughs> For the Lord's sake. Ultimately, the way you obey or disobey should be for the Lord's sake, not for my sake. Not for me to pull my political chain and say, yes, I made a stand. You know? My fear is that Christians, especially in this political society that we have today, my fear is that Christians get wrapped up too much in the political side and not the Christ side. And may we as a church not be that. Yeah, it's easy to jump on the bandwagon of rebellion and, you know, patriotism. And, and, you know, this is not what our forefathers fought for. It's easy to jump on that bandwagon. But why are we not reflecting Christ in it? God, help us to reflect Christ for the Lord's sake. Okay? So, yes, in a perfect world, they're supposed to punish uh, the evil. They're supposed to uh, uh, praise the good. And in some cases... They don't. They do it opposite. But we have to do everything we can to do the right thing. Why? Verse number... Uh, verse number... Oh, let me read this real quick. So kings and governors are to praise, punish evil, praise good. In perfect world, government will operate this way. But just because we perceive it does not, does not grant us the right to be tyrants and rebels for Jesus. At this point in history, these believers were under Nero. <laughs> and try to operate under that as a believer. As a matter of fact, Christian church, Christ church has had to operate during many types of political systems. And the only way to thrive has been to adequately reflect Christ in submission to the office and not the officer. So it is, it is important for us to recognize that. Why? Verse number 15 says, for so is the will of God. What is the will of God? Submit. That's the will of God. We don't like that word, do we? Submitting equals the will of God. Why or how, he says? With well-doing. Not rebellion. No, you can't tell me what to do. You know, I am a Christian. I have been bought with a price and I am free. <laughs> yeah. He even addresses that right here. That with well-doing, he may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Yeah, what they're doing is foolish. Yeah, what they, the way they act and the decisions they're making is foolish. It's godless in many cases. But how are, we going to, how are we going to muzzle that? How are we going to keep them, the unbelieving people, how are we going to help them see Christ? By doing our part to submit as to the Lord, not to that man. What is, but here's what he says. Verse 16, this is where he addresses it. That's free. Not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. Okay. Because they had those guys. In those times, I'm sure they had their tyrants. They're not tyrants. They're, they're, they're patriots. They were like, well, I'm going to take up the sword for the cause of Christ. And I'm going to charge Nero's palace. And I'm going to show him we're not submitting to you. He said, no, 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 no. Don't use your cloak. Don't use that to cloak or to veil your malicious intent. You're not using it as a covering for your evil. What is the evil? What would the evil be? What would the maliciousness be? Not submitting. Rebellion. That's, that's what the evil is. Don't, don't use your freedom as a, as a calling card to step up and say, you can't tell me what to do. But if you recall, verse, verse, uh, verse number 16, as the servants of God. At this point in history, especially, servants and slavery was a real thing. Many people were still in bondage. Religiously speaking, especially. The Roman Empire had used Christian people as slaves. James uh, uh, addresses it about, about being uh, kind to the slaves and treating them properly and so forth. But the, the, the point is, they're, they're, what they're saying is, what, what, what Peter is telling them, as the servants of God. See, you are a slave, if you would, of God. 
So how would you obey God in this moment? When they are coming down with their rules and their regulations, how would you obey God? That's how you obey that rule and regulation. Okay, if they come in here and tell me I need fire extinguishers at every exit, I'm going to do that. That's not for my... Uh, well, you can't tell. Show me in the Bible. This is my authority. No. They're just trying to protect. So, so what good does that do for me to just... Uh, and then the building burns down and we have 100 people in here and people die because we couldn't put it out with a fire extinguisher. Right? I mean, not that that's actually going to happen, but you know, like... We, we, we get this idea that because I'm a Christian, you can't tell me what to do. And, and guys get out there and they think that they don't have to uh, you know, submit to this and submit to that. We should be submitting because of Christ as the servants of God. Okay? And we're going to close it out with these, these last verses. Okay? We have a few minutes. I think I said that already. Here's what he says. This is just some, some brief statements in these verses. Honor all men. Okay, that means to fix a value upon or esteem. Honor all. Okay, so we, we look at everybody as valuable. Okay, Joe Biden, as much as we disagree with the man, has value to God. God wants his soul to be saved just as bad as he wanted your soul to be saved. There's value there. So that, that political figure that you just can't stand every time his face pops up on the screen, just remember, there's value. Honor all men. <laughs> I love this. Love the brotherhood. Okay, that brotherhood, remember, remember uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the priesthood? Same idea, same principle. Brotherhood is the fraternity, the Christian fraternity of the same class, profession, occupation, or character which we have in Christ. Love each other. He doesn't want us fighting with one another. So, so not only does he not, us want, not want us fighting against our government, he doesn't want us fighting against each other. Fix value upon them. Fix value upon each other. Love each other. Okay? Fear God. Now you're going to notice this is sort of the central theme here of the verse. Fear God, honor the king. Be in awe or reverence or being alarmed by God. There should be a reverence there. If we remember that when we are submitting to the authority, then we will be in, in proper reverential fear of God, of worship of God. If we remember that. Okay? Remember, what is the motive? What is our motive? To glorify God. What is the motive? The salvation of the, of, of the unbeliever. What is our motive? So why do I submit to the governor? Why do I submit to the king? Why do I honor the brothers, uh, the all men? Why do I honor the king? For the glorification of Christ. Keep going. Here's what he says. By the way, I want to show you. He says, honor the king. Let me see if I have these verses right. Nope, that was, that was Peter. Proverbs 24. Uh, my son, fear thou the Lord and the king. Meddle not with them that are given to change. Uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. They see the world. That, you know, it has been said, whether we agree with this statement or not, that for some, you are the only Bible that others will read. Whether you agree with that statement or not. Okay? The point being... Who, look, how you're living your life, how you're either obeying or rebelling, rebelling against the, the government or, or the leadership in your life because they're anti-God or anti-this or anti-that, anti-you, okay? Will somebody be able to see, you, see Christ in you? Will they be able to see the gospel still playing itself out in you? Because Jesus didn't do that. He didn't run through the, through the, through the streets of Jerusalem saying, Oh! Caesar down with Caesar down with Caesar. No. The only time, as a matter of fact, the only time you see him throwing a fit was with the religious zealots that were trying to make a profit off of God's people. Are you following me? So we should be in submission. Jesus did that as our as our <laughs> as our example. Okay? So we don't we don't have a, we don't have to be rebellious. Right? Take some time to study Nehemiah. 
Nehemiah was a great example of this. He went to the king. He, he, he asked the king for letters of approval. He followed the proper procedure. He said, hey, I'm going to go here. I want, I want, I want uh, material. I want to do this. He didn't do it beyond the king's approval. He didn't just say, hey, God gave me this vision. I am going forward. No. He asked the king. The king gave him his, his approval. He actually gave him a letter. He took that letter to the governors and all that. Read it sometime. He honored the king. He did that in submission to those that were in his authority. And he closes this out. And I'm hoping to close this out. But look what he says. Servants, be subject to your masters. Now there's that word again. Servants.